Tonight, Kyle talks about dinner. And he served them chicken and dessert and everything else, and it was all made out of a sweet potato. Steve asks a personal question. Is your foot greater than 100 um, miles per hour? <laughs> and I give my highest rating yet. That I wasn't terrible. Why, hello, my fellow apes. I hope you are well. Welcome to the fifth episode of Low Fruit. And, well, we've got a great one for you. Really great. And by great one, he means this is probably going to be miserable and terrible as usual. Yes, that is... (laughs) Well, they know what great means by now for low fruit, okay? It's that moldy fruit from, you know, it's been stood on a couple of times. Can you stop complaining that we're not low fruit, we're digging our fruit out of the ground? Yeah. Just because it's underground doesn't mean it's not low. Yeah, that that (laughs) criticism's too accurate. That actually hurts. Now, (laughs) few announcements beforehand. Yeah. Low fruit slices. We're going to be starting a channel where we take the best bits or the bits that have got the most amount of attention and we've put the, put it on this channel for you you to be able to see in the small yeah, sections. Yeah, just small couple of minute sections of our greatest hits. So go and check that out if you want to relive those moments. Yeah, because you do want to relive those moments, <laughs> let's be honest. For example, both mammals are nearly hairless. <laughs> That's just brilliant. That's proof they're related. What are they doing? That's a cutout. That's 30 odd seconds. They've cut 30 seconds oh. where I actually make my point. That's just brilliant. <laughs> or if you didn't see them because it was too long. Yeah, and talking about <laughs> reliving moments, um, the second announcement pertains to the POW poll that we released. Mm. And th- this relates to pa- uh, Matt Powell's technique of citing a source that debunks his own argument. Um, beautiful, yeah. beautiful technique. Like real, real good stuff there. Thank and you, everyone that voted on that. But I still can't get my head around how you'd basically decided within the first fifteen minutes of the poll being posted yeah. which was going to be the winner. You know what? In reflection, I I can understand because yeah. Trojan Source, which is the winner, is really good. Yeah, that's true. Really, we we really probably excellent. should have went through the comments to find find whoever mentioned that because that was awesome. Yeah. Whoever you yeah. are. Well Great played. One. Yeah, well played. And the um, cartoon that you can see, um, it's not it's not Matt, okay? No, it's not based on his likeness, okay? It might look a little bit like him, but it's not him. And it, let's face it, it's beautiful. Uh, it's going to be available on a t-shirt probably by next month, so look out for that one. And just one last thing then, before we get rolling with this month's episode, uh, there's a few uh, corrections to make from, from last time when we were dealing with Kennedy Hall. It doesn't make any logical sense. Uh, When I was talking about uh, entropy, I should have been using the term isolated system rather Mm -hmm. than uh, closed system, because in a in a closed system, energy can still move in and out, but but matter can't. Um, It's only in an isolated system that energy cannot be inputted. So unfortunately, trying to to counter complete and utter misunderstanding with only a layman's understanding it's not always going to get you the most accurate response. So, they, they might so, forgive you. They might. I know. You. Thanks for everyone that corrected me on that one yeah. because uh, I'd rather get it right next time, frankly. So. Another correction that should be stated um, relates to Lucy. When she was discovered, uh, Lucy, of course, being the first Australopithecus afarensis that was discovered, mm-hmm. um, when they discovered her, her hip was broken and crushed, and it was in such a way that it wouldn't have allowed for any kind of movement, movement whatsoever. So, uh, so bipedal or, quad, or quadrupedal. So he was right; they yeah. did break it to reform. Yeah, he was he was correct on that. And um, but but there's a couple of things to be mentioned. First of all, one, it, it couldn't move in any case. No. Two, it's not just the hip that indicates bipedality. You also have like the knee bones, the spine. There's lots and lots in Australopithecus afarensis that indicates uh, bipedal locomotion. And the other thing is that we've discovered lots and lots more of them. There's lots of Australopithecines and, and afarensis as well. Consequently, we know that they were correct. They've been vindicated in in in. Um, breaking it in the way that they did yeah and uh last correction for now then is going to be steve a lady peacock is a pea hen yeah (laughs) yeah yeah cock is the key word in this case so the more you know the more you know the more you know that the species is a a pea fowl which many more of you knew than we did um but (laughs) frankly Getting that wrong really does highlight how easy it is to to absorb incorrect information. I've heard the term peacock so many times, but I'd never heard the word peafowl before. Yeah, that's true. I mean, for me, I, I was just on autopilot. It's like if someone goes, the cat, the cat, the cat. I'm not thinking male cat, female no. cat, or anything along those lines. 
And it's like, yeah, peacock, peacock. That's what that is. That is it's a- like, well, no, it isn't. That's just the males. So, so okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Anywho, on yeah. with the show. This time we are receiving a sermon from Kyle Butt. And if you know who Kyle Butt is, then you, you know what we're getting ourselves into. <laughs> Let's do this. It's time to begin. I want to welcome everyone. We're excited about tonight. Uh, are you? Are you really excited? You don't, you don't <laughs> you, you sound really excited. You really don't sound it. You, if you're not excited. <laughs> that, that enthusiasm is, yes. is so infectious. I'm re- Our audience must be as ready for this as uh, I, I am. I think they're probably really excited. Excited about this series that we're launching. We want to welcome uh, everyone. Okay, so we're going to approach this a little bit differently to what we normally do. And that's because we've, we went on ahead and this is just rambling it's It's a sermon it's a sermon right (laughs) what do we expect and what we're interested in is the arguments Mm. so we're going to fast forward to the arguments however um we're not going to traverse exactly the same ground as we just did with kennedy so if the exact same arguments are being made by kyle which often is the case you know they're both creationists we're not going to address it here Um, yeah what we'll do though is um we'll put some time stamps up uh, just in case you you know you really feel that you're missing out on the word salad, uh, you can go check it out afterwards. <laughs> it's really exciting. <laughs> Why is it that if you say we're going to be debating the existence of God, you can get 1,500 people on the campus of a university in Florence, Alabama, but if you say we're going to be having a gospel meeting, you'll hope to get 250 or three. All right, so this is Kyle's first question. He's yeah. asking, why is it that so many people will turn up to a debate but not a mere sermon? Now, I I, I have an answer to this. It's yeah, probably <laughs> a little bit different to what most people would give, but I want to know yours first. Well, I suspect my answer is probably going to be what most people will be thinking. Yeah, uh, well, I am the layman here. <laughs> I'm so a layman t- as well. to me, someone just sort of waffling their belief at me without ever being challenged, because no one there is going to ever challenge what he's saying. Mm. That's a lot less interesting than, you know, hearing new points being refuted, rebuffed, or possibly even strengthened, you never know. People who are religious, they're going to be going to these sermons sort of all the time. They've they've heard this all before. Yeah. They're going to hear it again next week. But a debate, that's new. And yeah, I see what you're saying about like the repetition kind of thing. Mm. They can go to a sermon whenever well, they want. Yeah, yeah, they can go to a sermon whenever they want. When a debate comes off, mm. well... They're going to probably hear things they've never heard before. They're going yeah. to hear arguments presented. They're going to hear, mm-hmm. you know, their side. Oh, they'll have some new smart thing that can be yep. presented to refute what these atheists they've yeah. been hearing are saying. Yeah. That's interesting. And they'll be able to see, like, people they look up to actually, you know, lock horns with the other, the enemy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, think that, I think that plays a large part. That might be the primary. I mean, the, the tree that I was going to bark up is that... So after st- studying apologetics and in- and interacting with apologetics for years now, mm. um, I I'm really now convinced that apologetics isn't about truth. That's if it's about truth at all. That's as a subset. It's not actually the main aim. The main aim is to soothe or obfuscate the cognitive dissonance of the flock, and this is why I think a lot of religious people um, will turn up to these debates. It's they might be struggling with something that seems to be a contradiction in their worldview. For instance, you know, children dying of cancer, you know, animals dying in in forest fires Mm. before humans exist, unless you're a creationist. You know, like having these kind of thoughts and and being able to compute that with an all-powerful, all-loving God, that's like can cause this cognitive dissonance. And then when you turn up and you watch people debate it and you see them being super confident, yeah, it kind of gives the illusion that, okay, well, I can't figure this out, but this person that's smarter than me, per my own perception, they figured it out. So really, I'm just overthinking I it. I see what you're saying. They, they're yeah. using the person who's in the debates or whatever as, as a crutch to support yeah. their own their own positions because they've yeah. probably not thought it through. So somebody else who gets to do the... <laughs> sounds yeah. pretty poor here. Do the thinking for them. Yeah. Um, yeah, I could kind of see that actually. Yeah. Um, and a wow, great example of this is is Kent Hovind. He definitely doesn't go into debates in search of truth. No, he goes to preach. The Bible teaches hell is in the earth. That's all I can tell you. Because he's never corrected anything. Because he's never changed anything yeah. that you know when he's been argued against so many times. Yeah. He's never updated anything to at least try and represent more accurately what he's debating against. Mm. He goes to preach, and the people that are there, they know what they're getting from him. Yeah. 
you, I, you might you be right. See, you can see in the comments they're literally saying, "Oh, thanks, you're my hero." You mm. know, you're 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 helping me, and uh, you know, yeah. But I think it's a co- co- collection of these things. Yeah. But uh, but yeah. Um. Anyway, <clears throat> let's uh, let's get on with it. Well, I think what we're seeing there is the fact that people are interested in whether or not Christians can stand up publicly and defend their belief in the existence of a supernatural spiritual creator against skeptics who say there is not one. All right, fair enough. He seems to be more on your line of thinking. Yep, and that's I'd, I'd feel pleased with that if it wasn't a creationist line of thinking. He, he, he's on your side, good <laughs> sir. Um, but did you notice how he framed skeptics as those that affirm that there are no gods? Yeah. There are no gods. Against skeptics who say there is not one. Yeah. And, and, and funny enough, had he said atheist rather than skeptic, he'd mm. at least have ground to stand on, you know, with the, the philosophical in, in definition. In a philosophical definition, yeah. Because, um, well, skeptic literally means having doubts. Yeah. Having doubts, having reservations. That's all it means. So You can't define that as affirming, affirming. the negative of a certain proposition. <laughs> and so the question comes to us tonight, can we do that? And is the idea of God even a scientific question? You see, what we're told lots of times is that the scientific method says that you have to be able to touch, see, taste, hear, or smell whatever it is you're saying exists. And that if you can't do an experiment on it with your five senses, then it's not science. We're um we're not playing around with the speed. That by the way, he really does just start randomly speeding up like this and then slowing back down again to emphasize a word and then speeding up. He does, it, yeah. It's, it's uh, a very uh, strange cadence. Maybe maybe it gets people to pay more attention to him. It's it's hard to follow though. Okay, well it's not working in <laughs> it's this. It's not working case, for me. Yeah. But um in that section, the reason why I've actually paused here is he claims that science means that it's verifiable by the senses. Yeah. Uh, well. Um, He's, he's going to be equivocating on what it means for senses. That's what yeah. I'm predicting because I've seen this done before. Uh, senses as in like seeing, touching, tasting, the, you know, some of the examples that he just gave versus um, you've got, to take for example, the Big Bang. Uh, we know that the Big Bang happened because of observations such as the uh, microwave background, um, such as the red shifting of celestial, um, uh, celestial objects. objects yep. Or, or take the Roman Empire, right? Yeah. The Roman Empire, we know that the Roman Empire exist, uh, existed, not because we can lick it, but because uh, <laughs> but because we have archaeological evidence showing, you know, that they had the province of Britannica, etc. You can you can do it via those means. Yeah, uh, talking of licking things, that's obviously yeah. how we date dinosaur bones. Is, no, wait. That's how no, Matt we does don't, it. That's just brilliant. We don't date dinosaur bones by licking them or touching them or just looking at them. No, yeah. we, we have to date Carbon them by... 14. No, <laughs> almost <laughs> yep. it is the the measuring the decay material of radioisotopes within the fossils. So this is all observation, mm. but that's not just literally looking at touching it yeah. or. And you know what? It. Maybe maybe he won't equivocate on senses in the way that I'm predicting. But I well, think he already he has. <laughs> yeah, this this is where he goes. Do you know nothing could be further? from the truth. That's not how science historically has ever operated. You know, some of the most well-known scientists of the last generation or of the last hundred years were adamant, very vociferous, very, very outspoken creationists. The last generation... No, no. Scientists of the last generation... Um, or even the last century have not been vociferous creationists. No. I'm, I mean, I'm really glad that he named them. That, <laughs> I mean, that was great. If he had just said um, outspoken Christians, yeah. uh, I might have agreed with him, or at least let the comments slide anyway. Mm. But even though what people believed outside of their observations, well, it, it doesn't mean they used science to form those beliefs. Yeah, even if, like, off the last century, all of the scientists were vociferous creationists, <laughs> It wouldn't follow that they got to those views via the scientific method. No. At all. Um, um, I mean, remember, faith is not scientific. No, and uh, in fact, many Christians um, will tell you that forming all of your beliefs through scientific means is uh, scientism. Scientism, so, that's true, yeah. <laughs> so Kyle, you better not try to pull that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in fact, they said, hey, we're thinking God's thoughts after him. Sir Isaac Newton? Who's famously not from the last generation. <laughs> 
<laughs> or century. Sir Isaac Newton, we have an entire branch of physics called Newtonian physics. What you might be interested to find out is that he wrote more Bible commentary than he ever wrote scientific papers. Yeah, but he also wrote a buttload of alchemy. But that's not what we remember him for. We remember him for his hits, not his misses. <laughs> he, with all of his heart, believed that God was a scientific idea. George Washington Carver, who one time invited all of his friends over to have a seven-course meal, and he served them chicken and dessert and everything else, and it was all made out of a sweet potato. And then he studied the peanut and was able to make over 300 different items from a peanut. And he said that God had given him a singular mission in life, and that was to learn everything there was about a peanut. That sounds pretty nutty to me. Bro. I know. I really regret Bro. it. I'll see myself <laughs> And he still hadn't successfully done that after he made 300 different items from a peanut. The scientists of the last generation and of the last hundred years or so, they all understood that God is definitely a scientific idea. Uh, no, they had a belief in God and not necessarily for scientific reasons. Yeah, and ag again, the scientists that were creationists tended to exist before 1859 because mm. that's when Darwin published The Origin of Species, which includes Newton, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it's because natural selection is one off, if not the most brilliant scientific theory that we have. I'm, I'm just thinking at the moment, yeah. it's like I had all sorts of stupid beliefs when I was younger. Yeah. Um, a good example, I didn't believe in God. I did think that Noah's flood was a real thing because I thought it was unlikely someone would include something so obviously scientifically wrong in their writings. So I thought you, I had to. Have you, you laugh, right? But um, there's a real piece of apologetics that's put out that relates to C.S. Lewis. Right. C.S. Lewis basically makes the same point about the story of Jesus. He says, this is just so crazy that it's got to be true. <laughs> <laughs> like it, 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 uh, we have you, to deal with get, that properly in another video, but that that is a line that he makes. You get so. to it from reasoning. Yeah, it's not a scientific no. reasoning. <laughs> no, and also like if you believed that the Bible must have been correct in Noah's Ark, because you would think, why would they put something so stupid in? Yeah. Do you also did you also used to believe that people lived to a thousand years old? No. So I don't know why I believed that one thing. <laughs> Talk, talking snakes? No. <laughs> why did you believe Noah's Ark? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but what's happened here is the definition of science has changed in the last, say, 30 years. But has it? Is it has it changed in the last 30 years? Well, considering that by the last generation he meant Newton, I'm thinking that by the last 30 years he, mean, he probably means the Napoleonic era. But consider for a moment Sir Francis Bacon. He formulated the scientific method that we use today and did so in 1620, which of course is before Newton. Yeah, oh yeah, way before. Um, <laughs> and yet Bacon is known as the father of empiricism. And um, I mean, what else do you need? Well, anyway, you've wasted all your time explaining Sorry, that. Sorry, yeah. Because this is totally irrelevant. Because definitions do change over time. Evolve, one might say. Yeah. And uh, and so we're going to use the most recent version for our discussions today. It doesn't matter if people use a different definition in the past. What's the definition today? Yep. Let's see what he's using. In the last 30 years, people have said, it's a scientific idea if you give a completely natural explanation without resulting or without saying that there's a supernatural explanation. No, I'm pretty sure that's not what anyone says uh, the definition of science is no. or, or how no. they use science. Now, I largely agree that a, a natural explanation is probably going to be a better explanation than a supernatural one, but that doesn't mean we have to rule one out. Science is the study of our world and the phenomena that occurs within it through observation and experimentation. Yeah. If you manage to, to observe supernatural phenomena, we'll have a supernatural explanation. Yeah. What, what science desires is explanatory value. Mm. It in no way insists that the explanation can only be from a natural source. It yeah. just so happens to be the case that it always is. Yeah, but with, with the, the explanation, though, mm. and, and God is an explanation, we need to be able to falsify it in some way. Yeah, that's so critical. You need yeah. to be able to test it and compare it with the other explanations that we have. 
With God, however, the explanations have been either outright disproven or cannot currently be falsified. So they said, you can come up with any explanation you want. You can say aliens seeded the planet from millions of light years away. You can say there was a huge explosion. And it's all scientific as long as you don't say there's a God. You can see this this straw man he's beginning to manufacture, right? Mm. Because, no, if you want to say that aliens seeded Earth, then you have to show evidence of it. Empirical, testable, verifiable evidence. And until you do that, it's just... It's not a scientific claim. You're just making an assertion. You're not supporting it with any science. Yeah, and um, if that evidence, by the way, turns out to be NAF, uh, like it did for the the octopus paper that (laughs) Matt Powell loves, um, well, we're going to discard the claim. Because God wouldn't be a natural explanation. You know what's interesting to me? It's kind of like what has changed in science is it's been limited. And, And we're going to say science because real science, what we're going to see tonight shows that you can definitely identify a way to come to a real conclusion. (laughs) So what you mean by real science, then, Kyle, is when you can find a way to find the conclusion that you want. Yeah, that that is what he said, isn't it? (laughs) That's not science. That's confirmation bias. (laughs) And here's what modern science has done. They've said, okay, you can give us any explanation except one that gives you a supernatural entity. That is bollocks. And it'd be like doing this. You go to somebody's backyard and you find an apple. Oh man, this analogy is going to hurt, isn't it? And you look at the apple and the apple has a bite out of it. And you have this apple with a bite mark out of it and it's in someone's backyard. And the person says, okay, you can explain how this apple got here in any way you want to. You just can't say the person who lives in this house took a bite out of it. I was right. That was terrible. Mate, this guy has got the understanding of, well, a creationist. I I agree, but when did you get the apple? God. You got it from God. (laughs) Well, actually, that's quite good because um, Mm. he's already concluded God. He's already concluded that this apple is God. So Mm. he's really upset that people won't accept this answer to any question, even if we already have better explanations. Mm-hmm. What he's trying to do is he's working off the basis yeah. that, you know, this is God's house, so the apple must be God's. Well, it, it doesn't work. If you had an apple mm. and you say that it's got a human bite in it, then you've already presupposed, you you already have empirical evidence, obviously, to say that it's a human bite. You know, uh, the dental records within the apple, you yeah. know, maybe maybe a fingerprint on the apple or something. So I, I imagine thinking that that's not scientific. Like well, forens- got, forensic when, doesn't count as scientific. When you've got and, empirical and fr- evidence. And Bacon and like, you know, <laughs> Newton and whatnot, they, they didn't realise this. Like, come on. So a better analogy might be here then. We found an apple with a bite mark out of it. Mm-hmm. Kyle here has said that it might be a god that did it. But, well, we've got the guy <laughs> with whom the teeth marks yeah. match. And, well, I can see him eating the apple. <laughs> Are you saying that God could not have bit this apple? Because I'm getting sick of your science denial. <laughs> okay, so you happen to run across some dental records, and the dental records of the teeth of the person that lives in the house matches the bite mark perfectly. You have fingerprints on the apple that match the person's fingerprints in the house and everything points to the idea that the person in the house took a bite of the apple and threw it in the yard. Yeah, so why are you still claiming it's God? And everything points to the idea that the person in the house took a bite of the apple and threw it in the yard. And they say you can give any explanation you want. You can say it hit a tree, bounced off a rock, and bugs started nibbling on it, and that's what made this particular... You can use any explanation you want, you just can't say it was the person who owns the house. Right. Even by Kyle's own standard, this analogy doesn't work, since the owner of the house is a natural being, not a supernatural being. He would need it to be... The analogy just doesn't work. No. We've done... What was this? This is episode five of Low Fruit, yeah? Yeah. There's one thing I've become quite certain on. Creationists can't do analogies. <laughs> no, I absolutely hate them. Carl, you had one job. Create an analogy using a supernatural being. Not a natural one. One what, job. What a vociferous pastry. <laughs> that might be one of your best ones yet. <laughs> we well, say when you start doing that, then... You're limiting the idea of science. 
The fact of the matter is, the real definition of science, it comes from the Latin word, and it means the study or the search for knowledge. Yeah, that's that's a very archaic definition. I mean, mm. we're talking when Latin wasn't a dead language, and <laughs> before the United Kingdom even existed, let yeah. alone the United States, or the church he's preaching at. <laughs> yeah. But not before Newton. Anyway, um, <laughs> but by that definition, a priori knowledge, um, such as all bachelors being married, would count as scientific. Yeah, but that, that's just an analytical statement. Yeah, it's an analytical statement, but that's how broad that, that net is that he's just given us. Now, what's interesting to me is that Anthony Flew, in his book, says, I have always done one thing. And what I have always tried to do is follow the evidence where it leads. And what I'd like to suggest tonight is that that's what every one of us should determine that we will do. We will follow the evidence where it leads. You see, lots of times you're told that if you're a Christian and you have faith, then you're not an evidence-based thinker. That, that likely has something to do with the Bible defining faith as belief without evidence. Yeah. Um, Hebrews 11.1. Well, it states, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now, obviously, depending on the version you're using, the wording might be a little bit different. Yeah. But how can you say that that is yeah. not saying that faith is belief without evidence? What's more, the answer of faith, as in believing something without adequate evidence, is a very common response that you'll get from religious people when you push them to their limits. Yeah. They may have an answer and then you you know you'll put a bit more pressure on them and then they step back and in the end they are almost always almost all of the conversations I have end up with them saying you got to have faith. It's because it's the answer that's given. Yeah. When they've run out of answers. Then really, here's what's happened. You've allowed some preacher to stand up in front of you and you check your brains at the door and you come in and you sit on a pew and you open your head and you let that preacher dump anything he wants to in it. And then you close it and you walk out and you, live criti you leave critical thinking at the door. You have not done or said anything yet in any of this sermon to prove that idea false. You know, Sorry. <laughs> this would explain why religious beliefs seem to so heavily correlate with geography. That's what you're told is the case. But what we're going to discover is that's not what the case is at all. In fact, you have to be an evidence-based, logical, rational person to come to a reasonable conclusion that there is a God. I agree. You need evidence to come to a reasonable conclusion that there is a God. I agree. Now give us the evidence! <laughs> <laughs> now, let me tell you what I mean by a reasonable conclusion. There are two ways you can come to a conclusion. You can come based on reasons and you can come based on motivation that have no connection whatsoever to your conclusion. I believe in God because my grandma did and she made the best fried pies I've ever eaten. Okay, is that a motivation for why you believe in God? Yes, you believe in God because your grandmother did and she made the best fried pies in the world. That's, that's quite an effective straw man of the observation that you just gave, Steve, with yeah. you know, religious beliefs corresponding to geography. What he took there, the first bit is, um, oh, you believe because your grandma did. Yep. And then he added in the pie bit. The pie bit is irrelevant here, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's, not, <laughs> it's not that religious people believe because their grandmother makes a good pie. No, it's, it's more... It's the likelihood that your yeah. your grandparents, your parents, and and you you're, you're yeah. growing up in a society where there's a a predominant religion, so you're more likely to adopt that predominant religion. Yeah. Um, and if you even then your your family's going to be motivated mm -hmm. to to push their beliefs onto you because they're going to believe that well you're going to suffer if you don't believe the same thing they do. Yeah. That might be why. That is. It's why. nothing to do with pies. <laughs> My grandmother made the best fried pies in the world. She believed in God, therefore there is a God. Is that a rational conclusion? No, there's no evidence connection there. That's a motivation for you. I believe in God because I want to. I believe in God because it makes me feel good. I believe in God because my parents always have believed in God. I believe in God because people at my work do and I fit in better. Are there motivations that people can have for believing in God that aren't rational conclusions? Absolutely positive. But to follow what the idea of biblical faith is you have to rationally and reasonably look at the evidence that then forces you to conclusion to the conclusion therefore god exists
Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, and certain of what we do not see. Hebrews 11.1 1. Now, let's move into this idea of the idea of God being a scientific idea. Do we study things or look at things scientifically on a regular basis that you can't touch, see, taste, hear, or smell? Yeah, yeah. All, all the time. All the time. All the time. <laughs> oh, all the time. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> the entire thesis of forensic science is that you arrive on a crime scene and the person who perpetrated the crime is not there is the person well then i guess a supernatural god did it <laughs> makes sense i mean if the person was there then you would just apprehend him right there you would have all that you needed okay when you arrive on a crime scene doing forensic science you're looking at things that the criminal left you're looking at fingerprints you're looking at tire marks you're looking at dna blood drops or something of that nature the criminal's not there you can't touch see taste here or smell the criminal you are just trying to find traces that the criminal left yeah, but but that's still observation you know we don't need to see the crime to make observations about it, it it's no. fine as per the baconian model that's existed for 30 years or something. <laughs> is that, wait, is that older than Newton? No, he's only a generation. <laughs> um, but look, Kyle had the job, again, of creating an analogy with a supernatural explanation. <laughs> yeah. And again, he's given an analogy with a natural explanation. He's doing well here on One the job, but that's two for two. That is two, that's, for, that's two, two for two. Now, would any of us, if we're walking on a beach, and we look down, and we see some footprints... <sighs> For God's sake, this is going to be some convoluted Paley's watchmaker analogy. No, I've heard this version so many times, yeah. it should be called the Paley's beach walker yeah. analogy. <laughs> I, want, I wonder if the watch is going to be supernatural or natural. <laughs> and those footprints are going in a straight line. It looks like it's a left foot, right foot. You can see that there are five toes on each of the footprint. There is a heel, there is an arch. Now, who would look at footprints on a beach, look up the beach and not see a human and say... It's natural. <laughs> now, who would look at footprints on a beach, look up the beach and not see a human and say... These footprints couldn't have been made by a human because we don't see the human. Kyle, this is the third time that you're making an analogy that's meant to be about God, about a supernatural being, yep. and yet your scientific evidences have all been natural. <laughs> Three for three. Do we need to get another pal counter going? Yes, we do. We need a counter of uh, false analogies. <laughs> Let's do this. Can you know something about a human that makes footprints without ever seeing the human? Okay, so his question is a little confusing here, so uh, I'll repeat it. Can you know something about the human that makes footprints without ever seeing the human? Surely only if you've seen another human making footprints. Yeah, exactly. If, yeah. if you've seen other examples mm. of humans to know that they make footprints, then, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. There are things you can learn well about this particular human from their footprint without ever seeing them. So, uh, for example, you can measure the size of their feet. You can probably also take a, a good estimate at what their weight might be, from you mm -hmm. know, uh, depending on the type of material the footprint's in. Uh, if there's multiple footprints, you can uh, make inferences about their gait. Yeah, there's loads of things we can learn. But it's yeah. all done through observation. Yeah, and to rephrase his question, because I think there's a bit of a begging the question thing going on here, right? We can ask, can you know something about a unicorn's footprints uh, without ever seeing the unicorn? Because um, by saying the unicorn's footprints, you're presupposing the unicorn. You, you have to be. This yeah. actually reminds me of the Ray Comfort thing of um, uh, you can see... What was it? What was it? It was all the... All of the footprints scream... Bigfoot. Over, you can see Bigfoot in the footprints. <laughs> all of creation screams that there's a creator. You can see the genius of God's creative hand through creation. That was it. That's the one. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the problem this way is obviously if, if you've never seen a unicorn before, how do you know that a unicorn can even make footprints? Yeah. Let alone whether the footprint you found belongs to one yeah. so in the same way if you've never seen a human before how can you make any inferences about a human from a footprint you can't be sure belongs to one yeah and this bit is analogous to god what i've just said here mm -hmm. if you've never seen an example of a god before you how can't. do you know anything you're seeing is the creation of a god 
Oh, absolutely, positively. In fact, if you have enough good information and equipment, number one, if you measure the distance between the prints, what could you tell about the individual that left them? The approximate height of the individual? If you had something that would measure the density of the sand and give you a depth at which the prints sunk in, then you could tell approximately how much the individual weighed. This is good, actually. Um, it seems like we're on the same page so far, but um, thinking about it, you can learn the weight without even knowing if it is a human mm. because you just need to measure the, the density of the material and the, the depth of the imprint. Yep. So, yeah, you don't even need to know if it's a human or not. And it, yeah, even if it wasn't a human, you'd be able to go, it's about this weight mm. because it's it's got all of its weight distributed in, it, with these two feet or one foot. Yeah. If you then could count the little prints on the front of the footprint and see that they had toes. You could tell they had five toes on each foot. You could tell that they had a heel and an arch. You could tell all kinds of things about the individual that made the footprints and never see the individual. Excellent. Now, how is this analogous to a supernatural being? Good, sir. We're about to find out, I'm sure. And yet, that would be extremely scientific and an approach that everyone would recognize would be something that would be appropriate to come to a conclusion. So would it then be appropriate to come to the conclusion that the Earth was older than 6,000 years if, mm. well, I don't know, maybe we've got some fossilized bones and we've tested them, analyzing the decay of the different radioisotopes. And, you know, we've noticed that they're older than 100 million years or so. Yeah. Know? That would, would that be a good conclusion? That absolutely would be appropriate, yeah. right? Scientifically appropriate. Just as it would be appropriate to conclude that the observable universe expanded from a hot, dense state around 13.8 billion years ago due to such evidence as the um, cosmic microwave background mm. and the red shifting of supernovae. Interesting. So well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask the simple question, if there is a God, what would you expect to find in the universe. Okay, so if there exists an all-powerful, all-loving God... No, you're going <laughs> to... He hasn't given us any attributes of this God yet. Come on. But dude, his grandmother makes apple pies. Okay? Check well, me. Uh, yeah, okay. Check uh, me. So, yeah, no. he, that is why he is a Christian. Yeah. The apple pies are why yeah, he's a Christian. He, yeah, he's ahead. a Christian. He's not just like a deist or something. No. Okay, so what he believes in is Yahweh. He believes in an all-powerful, all-loving God. Yeah. And the question is... What, we, what would we expect to see? But we can flip this because of, you know, a reductio. What would we not expect to see if there was an all-powerful, all-loving God? Well, I wouldn't expect to see earthquakes and tsunamis that result in terrible tragedies every year. Yes. Children dying of cancer. Animals perishing in forest fires long before the existence of humans. Yeah. Uh, genetic defects resulting in long-term suffering for those, that, you know, the ones that even managed to survive to adulthood. Yep. And flipping it um, on its head, one thing that we would expect to see is the more intelligent someone is trying to figure out God's world, the higher their propensity towards theism would be. Right? But that is not what we see. We see the opposite. If you're a yeah. philosopher or a scientist, your likelihood of believing in God is less. That yeah. is not what we would expect to see, especially, well, by the way... I don't want to sort yeah. of have that to insinuate that just being a Christian makes you stupid. Not at all. Not at all. However, like, you wouldn't expect to see that, especially you when you have infinite punishment and infinite reward predicated on belief. No. One last thing I'm thinking of now that we wouldn't expect to see with, you know, an all-loving, all-powerful God... Mm -hmm. um, Human sacrifice, genocide, and slavery. Yep. Gross misogyny. Yeah. Homophobia. Wouldn't mm. expect to see these things, and yet they are rife. They are rife in the Bible. Yeah, because somehow, um, as long as it's been commanded by this all-loving deity, sacrifice, genocide, and slavery are good things. Yes. And yet they want to claim the moral high ground. Mm. Here's what we're told right now. In the beginning, was matter. Mm, no, but, um, well, we'll let him finish. And matter begot the amoeba, and the amoeba begot the worm, and the worm begot the fish, and the fish begot the amphibian, the amphibian begot the reptile, the reptile begot the lower mammal, the lower mammal begot the lemur, the lemur begot the monkey, the monkey begot the man who imagined God. This is the genealogy of man. 
I mean, that was broadly on point. But it's the equivalent of explaining Christianity as the belief that a cosmic Jewish zombie who was his own father can make you live forever if you symbolically eat his flesh and telepathically tell him that you accept him as your master, so he can remove an evil force from your soul that is present in humanity because a rib woman was convinced by a talking snake to eat from a magical tree. Yeah, <laughs> it's not exactly the most charitable representation of the position, is it? No, but- it ain't worse either. Saying that, that that isn't the worst position that I've could, seen could, from a creation. That absolutely could deteriorate worse. <laughs> and matter begot the amoeba, and the amoeba begot the worm, and the worm begot the fish, and the fish begot the amphibian, the amphibian begot the reptile, the reptile begot the lower mammal, the lower mammal begot the lemur, the lemur begot the monkey, the monkey begot the man who imagined God. This is the genealogy of man. That's a almost word-for-word word quote from a man named George Smith. So, I don't know this quote, but uh, I think the almost in this almost word-for-word word is probably doing quite a lot of heavy lifting here. Yeah, searching for this exact quote, I can't find anything on Google. Surprising that. But if he'd just given us a link... I really wish these people would actually just provide references. To be fair, you can't expect them to give a link in a sermon. Yeah, but like the uploaded ser- sermon to his channel, <sighs> it's like I give links to my stuff. I have f- throughout all of my YouTube years. Sure. Can you expect people coming in to just watch a sermon, which, as you said earlier, mm. is probably only there to reinforce the beliefs? to have links that might challenge those beliefs. If I'm right, then no. But if actually it's about truth, then yes, you should expect to see it. And George Smith says that in the beginning there was nothing, and then somehow that nothing popped into life, and that life changed from one kind of life to another kind of life over multiplied millions of years. (laughs) We've just looked for George Smith claiming that, you know, in the beginning there was nothing. And, well, nothing is what we just found. I know that... I know that references is a bit too much to ask for when it comes to creationists. Uh, but what? I'm done. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> well, where did that initial stuff come from? Well, if you back up just a little bit, you ask the cosmologists, the people who study the origin of the universe, what they're going to tell you is that 13.82 billion years ago, There was a tiny something called a singularity that exploded and that explosion called called the Big Bang caused everything that you see in the universe. Being, you know, charitable with a few errors, I think that wasn't a bad representation of the Big Bang. No. That seemed um, all right. It was certainly better than what Kennedy offered last time. Which means ultimately you're going to have to explain to me how the Big Bang started from nothing, but at the same time it also needed a universe to begin. Yeah. Let's, uh, I'm genuinely I'm interested. Let's, let's, let's see what he has to say. Like, fair enough. Like, it didn't sound like he was trying to misrepresent it there. I'm, no, that's... I, 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 I'm pleased with that. For a creationist, and I don't mean... Well, it, it yes, comes you across do bad, but way. like, <laughs> for a creationist, that genuinely wasn't bad. Initially, it was just hydrogen atoms, and then they exploded in stars and cooked up all the other elements and things like that. And that's where the universe came from, according to the top thinking scientist at the present, that there was a tiny ball of, well, they don't know what to call it, just a tiny ball of something. They call it a singularity that exploded. Well, I I feel like giving him some props there. Like, mm, yeah. A, a few little notes. Okay, so it's expanded, not exploded. Mm. And the, the first elements to form were hydrogen and helium. Yeah. And and from there they accumulated into a larger mass, so that you know the stars didn't suddenly explode. And yes, from from the stars we then get the other elements. So yeah, that I, wasn't terrible. No, I, I completely agree, and I have to say it's it's very it's genuinely refreshing to see a creationist more than less present a view that they don't hold accurately. Like hmm. fair play, fair enough. Now here's the problem. The problem is there's another idea that's much more scientific. In the beginning, God. Oh, oh, but dude, the scientific evidence for evolution and the Big Bang are far superior to any of the evidence we have for God. Yes, which is which is why they are widely accepted yeah. by scientists around the globe, 
regardless of their religious beliefs. Yeah. The Big Bang was proposed by a Catholic priest. Yeah, and and many, (laughs) if not most, if I'm not mistaken, um, arguments for God's existence are a priori not a posteriori. Mm. They, they are analytical. They are they are to do with, you know, logic and reasoning and metaphysics. They're not, not to not do science. with... Yeah, they're not empirical data. There's another idea that's much more scientific. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God divided the light from the darkness, and the light He called day, the darkness He called night, and evening and morning, day one. And so we just need to ask some simple questions. Yes, yeah, such as where is any of the evidence for all of this? And don't say the Bible, because the Bible is where the claim is being made. That would be begging the question. <laughs> <laughs> Are there some scientific laws that we would be able to look at to determine which of those two ideas is true? The idea that in the beginning there was nothing. In the beginning there was nothing. Nothing. And then that nothing popped into something and that something exploded and brought the universe into existence. And there it is. Yeah. There's the misrepresentation. He's back down he's, on Kennedy's yeah, level. Yeah, he, he's straight back to where, you know, Hovind and Powell are. Creationists. How, how do you, you go from a relatively decent representation and flip it straight back to yeah. the, the, the same old bollocks that we've heard hundreds of times before? Stop saying this stop it like for crying out loud it's really bad so okay should we just move on to whatever claim um he makes next that isn't a misrepresentation of the big bang per us saying that we weren't gonna weren't gonna cover the same ground i know we said we were gonna skip ahead if you start making the same claims that kenny did but i I really want to hear the end of this bit just to make sure because I want to know why he thinks that God is more scientific. Why we have, you know, observable evidence that it is more likely to be true than the Big Bang. I, I, I just want to hear the next bit. All right. All right. I'm getting my coffee. The idea that in the beginning there was nothing, and then that nothing popped into something, and that something exploded and brought the universe into existence. Or, in the beginning, was a supernatural, all-powerful, intelligent being. Who brought the universe into existence from nothing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, okay, let's get this straight. He set up a false dichotomy uh, mm-hmm. between a straw man of the Big Bang yeah. and a supernatural, unembodied mind, of which we have no examples of, by the way, yeah. that possesses very specific, or not normally a- uh, omni attributes. Yeah. But before you can start to claim that a, yeah. a supernatural being can create everything, well, you're going to need to even prove that a supernatural being can exist Mm. you've got to start with that and then you've got to start proving its attributes yeah and then you can start talking about whether it created everything but you've skipped too many steps mate i'm still stuck on how often it is that they will go here's one hypothesis and it's their Mm. their very specific type of theism that has all sorts of ontological commitments and not very good explanatory value and then they go here is a misrepresentation of evolution or big bang they compare the two, they then ridicule the other one and act as if that somehow substantiates their hypothesis. Oh, you mean it's, how yeah, they just, they just not simply... how science or reasoning or logic or rationality or consistency works. Yeah. Uh I see what yeah. It must be one of these two things. Yeah. I'm not gonna try and prove this thing. What I'll try and do is discredit this thing. Yeah, they set it up and they go, if this is false, then the by reductio, this one must yeah, be true. Yeah, that, that is kind of what he's doing. Not there, how yeah. it works. Yeah, he said nothing in, in, in defense of the Bible so far on, on his biblical view. Now, here's what we're gonna do. Just take the laws of science that we know and apply them to these two ideas. Okay. So take for instance the law of conservation of energy which yeah. states that um, energy cannot be created or destroyed, merely transferred from one thing to another. Yep. Because if we apply um, this law to the universe itself, then we've just got it so that the universe necessarily existed forever. But I don't yeah. think he wants to do that. But it would be kind of nice if, you know, creationists, they're, they're so eager to jump on the, the second law of thermodynamics. <laughs> It'd be great if they knew what the first one was, wouldn't it? It would. It would. Now, there's one law of science. You guys know it very well. It's the most fundamental law of science that anybody ever works with. It's the law of cause and effect. Now, here's what the law of cause and effect says. Real, real simple. It says, for every material effect you see in the world, there's a cause that came before it and is greater than it. What? (laughs) 
<laughs> what the hell? He is just making things up. This is nosedived. Okay? Yeah. He's gone full creationist. Never go full creationist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> causation is just a, a concept yeah. describing uh, uh, progression. Yeah. It, it's not a law. And it's it, not a scientific law. Yeah, and it definitely doesn't state that, that the cause is always greater than the effect. <laughs> hey, um, yeah. Steve, haven't you already done a video dealing with this nonsense? Because I'm pretty damn sure you've you've done this definition before. Yeah, I've done this exact argument from Kyle. Good shout. I can't believe I forgot it. Is greater than it. I don't know about you, but when I first heard of this law of cause and effect, I had a case of the rock's eyebrow. And when Carl stated what the law is, I smelt what can only be described as divine excrement. If you copy-paste Carl's so-called most fundamental law of science, the most fundamental law of science, into Google, you'll find eight results, four of which are mirrors of Carl's script, three are theists quoting Carl's video, and one is to an inaccessible site. Simply put, Carl conjured it out of nothing, just as he claims his god conjured the universe out of nothing. Yeah, so his most fundamental law of science is only to be found in his sermons or someone <laughs> quoting his sermons. <laughs> yes, but he does have that creationist confidence, doesn't he? Oh, yes. That's, that's a card. That's a, ca that's a card. <laughs> that's a card. Now, here's what the law of cause and effect says. Real, real simple. It says, for every material effect you see in the world, there's a cause that came before it and is greater than it. So, obviously, aside from it not being a law, <laughs> there's a couple of things that have slipped in there that I, I would very much like to address, right? A material effect that doesn't require a material cause. Yep. And that the cause must be greater than the effect. Exactly. Give me a mm. single example, single example of a non-material cause. Mm, no. Okay, well, try giving me a single example of any cause that doesn't have a cause of its own. Go on, just one. Was well, so it something that's been led from something else, which has come from something else, which has but, come... But it itself didn't have a cause, which is what God would be. God caused the universe in his worldview, but God himself didn't have a cause. Give me one instance of that. So an, a non-contingent cause, essentially, then. Yes, yeah you, yeah. yeah, you could say a necessary cause, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Try giving me a single example of a conscious, non-material cause that wasn't caused by itself, that's all-powerful, all-loving, and collects foreskins for fun. <laughs> um, no, there's not much to say here about the non-material causes. Um, we don't have any... This no. is the thing. They, what they do is they appeal to our intuitions, and they go, look... It can't go back for infinite because of X, Y, and Z. And yet they don't realise that the same intuitions are also apply. Mm. It, it just... I don't know, man. Like, Sorry for the, the sort of a lot of silence there, but I can't... If you can think of one, write it in the comments, but I ain't got anything that comes to mind at the moment. Yeah. But leaving that one aside then, what about a cause that is must be greater than its effect? A cause that must be greater than its effect. Really? Okay. Kyle's sermon mm -hmm. is a cause that has led sense, to this yeah. effect as a response. Yeah, and I reckon video. within an hour, we're, we're going to have more views <laughs> than, than his video. Than yeah, his video so, so, so I think it's, got, I think a, it's great a greater effect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's I, I think that's fair. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'm just thinking as well. Have you ever stood on a Lego? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Because that's a very small cause, but well, it has the effect of you reacting like you just stood on a landmine. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Or Jenga, right? Yeah. You can have like Jenga in in such a situation where just opening the window, a slight bit of air or even your own breath is going to collapse the entire tower. Yeah, yeah. It's a balance, yeah. That's a tiny um, cause that has oh, a very big effect. I'll, I'll do a good one here. Yeah. What about a car, right? When you push your foot on the, the accelerator, that mm -hmm. has the effect of sending fuel through a small block of metal. Yeah, good, yeah. And that small yeah. block of metal accelerates the larger block of metal, you know, the car you're sitting mm -hmm. in, to hundreds of miles an hour. Yes. Now, is your foot greater than 100 um, miles per hour? <laughs> I mean, what does that even mean? It's, it's a great question. Isn't it? it's like, yeah. What what do you mean by yeah, greater? Yeah. What is greater than what? Because yeah, yeah. Yeah. he's he's only he's only slipped this greater in because he thinks yeah. that there can only be one thing greater than the universe. That's it. That's why it's there. Otherwise, yep. it's nonsense. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's see how this would work. Let's say I have a book. Uh, uh, here comes an analogy. I wonder if it would be a natural one. <laughs> all right, and I have this book, and I, I'm holding this book up, and all of a sudden, I drop this book, and I catch it, and then all of a sudden, I decide I'm going to put this book on this podium right here, and I'm going to continue talking to you. And that book launches across the room as I'm talking at 100 miles an hour, smashes into the TV in the back, makes a crashing, horrible sound. You all whip your necks back there. You see the TV is smashed. You turn to me and you say, Kyle, what caused that? But what if he put the book on top of snow causing an avalanche, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, then we could say that this tiny cause had a massive effect, yep. as we were saying, with the Jenga and the Lego, right? Um, and also, notice that he's applying this law that's within the universe, even if it is a law and it's not. Um, he's applying this to the universe itself. That's a fallacy of composition. Simple question. It's a real good question. What if I were to say nothing? You know, sometimes books spontaneously shoot themselves across rooms at 100 miles an hour and smash into TVs, and that's just how things happen sometimes. Well, you don't believe that, do you? Well, God. One reason why we might not believe this is, I don't know, we've never observed such an occurrence before, so we'd want an explanation better than that. Mm -hmm. We don't want to hear, well, it just is. No. That's just how it happens. That's what do things do. Kind of like how I'd want an explanation that's better than God did it. Yeah, that, and also not just with God did it, but if we were to ask, why is there some God rather than no God? How mm. do theists answer that? It's well, necessary. They either say it's, it, it just is. <laughs> it just is. Okay, great. Or they say it's necessary, and then you say, well, why are there some necessary things rather than no necessary things? It just is. Yeah, like, you, you eventually get back to, well, yeah. that's just how things are. And this is something I've noticed that um, apologists push on, by the way. If you take any narrative about the way in which the universe is, any of them, mm -hmm. Daniel Dennett expressed this as well. It's a really good point. If you take any narrative and you follow it through to its beginning or conclusion or whatever it might be, you basically you push it to its extremes, they all look nuts. A good example of this that Dennett gives is this. It's either the case that there's aliens out there that are conscious and intelligent like us. That's crazy. That's absurd. Mm -hmm. Or it's the case that there's no aliens out there. We are the only conscious species in the entire cosmos, which is also absurd. Like, these things always end in an absurdity. In fact, lo lots of times, you, like you say, you get a chuckle. That's funny. What if I said, no, 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 seriously, I've got a PhD in this. Sometimes books really do shoot themselves across rooms at 100 miles an hour. I'm being serious here. Well, then you might still kind of smile a little bit. But what if I then said, no, you're not taking me serious. You're, you're still smiling. What I'm trying to tell you is that sometimes books do this. You see, at that point, you'd start thinking, oh, hold on just a second. Yeah, um, hold on just a second. Mm -hmm. Have you got any examples of any scientists, you know, saying sometimes things just happen? Or are you trying to discredit the, you know, the entire field of physics at this point? Because obviously what you've been trying to do is discredit the idea of the Big Bang. Yeah. And also, I'd start thinking, well, it's not the PhD that makes it so that we should consider the point that she's expressing here. Rather, well, yeah, that would the, be appeal to authority, yeah, basically. Yeah. It's the science, right? The science is what we want to reference, right? We want the empirical evidence. So present that. The fact that someone's got a PhD... It's neither here nor there in this context. No, the, the important part is yeah. the fact that you can go and read the papers that outline all the evidence that they've had. Yeah. Mm. We know some things about the way the physical world works, and we know that books don't spontaneously shoot themselves across rooms at 100 miles an hour. That just doesn't happen. Yeah, and, and not having a prior example of something happening and no evidence to back the claim up is a very good reason not to believe something that someone said. But yeah. This is also the same with, you know, the idea of God creating the universe, where not only do we not have prior examples of supernatural beings, we have no evidence that one can even exist. Yeah, and so, an, yeah, that's good. And an, an, uh, an additional point, right, is that appealing to common knowledge doesn't work here. Mm. Newton, you know, the guy who apparently existed just one generation ago. I'm killing that joke. I'm sorry. Yeah, I've done well, it in one video. One video is going to be yeah, dead already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, <laughs> it's beautiful. But Newton believed that um, in the universe, 
everywhere in the universe experiences time exactly the same. Yeah. And um, this just isn't true. And most of our ancestors believed this, right? But then you had Einstein swing in and show that this just absolutely Theory isn't of relativity, the case. baby. So yeah, appealing to like common knowledge that we all know is true. Yeah, you got to be careful. And what's cool about this as well? Um, although we know that Newton's laws, you know, they're not quite right. Yeah, they're good enough to work on on certain scales. Yes, and it's the same with uh, Einstein's relativity as well. Is we know it's not quite right. Mm. But largely, it is very accurate for the things we want to use it for. Yeah. So that that's just an interesting thing about it knowledge is. there. In and general. just yeah, in case you're interested, the reason that we know it's not quite right is that it's not compatible with uh, quantum mechanics, which we think is more right. Um, and yet, Einstein's general relativity is so right, so correct um, that it's the accuracy of what it can uh, in in it predicting eclipses is amazing but well, I, I just want to drive towards something else very very quickly because you remember um the video you did on metaphorical truth yeah now what you could say is some of the things within there are common knowledge yeah they are absolutely wrong mm -hmm. but they are useful very useful yeah i wonder if we've got off point a bit here we might let's have. go back to see what he's saying but then when you go to the the people who claim to be using scientific laws to answer questions. And you say, where did that original stuff that exploded come from? Here's what they say. It popped into existence out of nothing. Oh, God. No. You just, he's just painted this as something that... He started all, so strong. He did. He's just... But he's just painted this as something all scientists say. Yeah. And that, that's not true. You may, or you probably will, mm -hmm. find a few examples of, of a few people uh, in the texts where they're going to say something, you know, roughly equivalent, yeah. something similar to that. But yeah. I bet, I bet there's a significant amount of context, mm -hmm. you know, surrounding that claim. And it's, and it's going to be context that is vital to it, that it changes it from yeah. something that is, oh, it just popped into existence. Well... One of the um, major bit of context that you're referring to here is that people mean different things when they say universe. So universe could mean our observable, you know, universe, mm -hmm. not a universe with a big U, which could turn out to be like the multiverse or something like that. Yeah, so a lot of the people that creationists quote is they take the people saying it in reference to our universe and act as if they're saying it about the totality of everything except for oh, God. Okay, okay. Um, or including God. Except for. What, what, yeah, that's basically <laughs> how it works. You know, they want to say everything's been created except for God. Yeah, like that's, yeah, yeah. That is what is happening here. Um, but yeah, just going back to necessity, right? Uh, Graham Oppie is a good example of a philosopher who believes that there's always been something that exists. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so not, yeah, not something. Yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. So there you go. Um, for me, really, whatever was before the Big Bang, you know, whatever it was could well have existed for eternity. I don't know. But I'm not going to make any claims about it. Yeah. Because, well, as far as I'm aware, we, we have no way of, of testing or proving what, if if anything, was there. So I'm not going to make any claims. And that's another thing to do with the uh, I don't know part, right, and the context that you were mentioning. The scientists and philosophers that he's loosely referring to they are they're agnostic on these propositions. They don't, oh, yeah. they don't know these things. They just go, Keyword. here's my view. Yeah. Keyword, propositions. Yeah. So sometimes when they're saying these things, this is, I'm proposing an idea here. Yeah. Let's go and test it. Hmm. Or let's wait until we can test it even. Yeah. Just because something's in a paper doesn't mean it's been confirmed as truth either. Yeah, you can argue Matt for a Powell. proposition. Yeah. <laughs> you can argue for a proposition without, like, thinking it's 100% true. Um, that's just not how it works. Anyway, let's go on. But yep. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty near the end here, to be honest. Absolutely. One eternity later. So we've just went through the rest of Carl's sermon, and honestly, it somehow goes downhill. There, and there's more importantly, there's just nothing to chew on. Um, feel free, of course, to go watch it yourself. Uh, I'd say that we recommend that you do, but we don't. Um, so, <laughs> so that's it. We're going to call it here, guys. We are done with we, Kyle. Yeah, we're done with that. Um, Thank you for, for joining us in in another hour-ish of, of complete suffering. Mm. Uh, Got to be pleased, actually. Yeah. Oh, um, you know how I always plug your channel at the end in, like, 
just a really good, like a real friend kind of plug for a channel. Yeah, it's been he's, great. It's got a channel where he looks at old things. So check it out if you want. It's true. I do. Yeah. Oh, and you did agree. He did agree. He did agree. Okay. You did agree. You know where I'm going with this. I do know where you're going with this. He has agreed that he's going to create a video on Jesus riding dinosaurs in England. He's agreed. Right. It's great stuff. Like every comment should be expressing right. the want for this by now. No, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm doing a video on yeah. how Henry the First came to power. That's what I'm doing. You. He even <laughs> spoke to me about a triceratop that he's going to have William the Conqueror depicted on. No, look. Yeah. If you keep saying this, there's going to be idiots out there that think this is a real thing. <laughs> Stop it. Such as Matt Powell. <laughs> yes, just like Matt Powell. 